is from the United States Patent and Trademark Office. It is the blueprint of a marriage. Did you know the states patented a marriage? Yeah. <clears throat> for all those of thinking about getting married or are married, this is for you. Or those that are divorced, it's still for you. See, <clears throat> the state is the primary in the contract. The state joins with the husband and then end joins with the wife. There is no direct line connection between the husband and the wife. What's the ENJ? End joins. End joins. End joins. Joins and end joins. End joins just means second position joinery. Okay. okay? So the state joins with the husband, end joins with the wife. There is no direct line between the husband and the wife. That is a broken line. Any architect or engineer will tell you that a broken line on a blueprint is a beam that bears no weight. And they put God on that line. So God bears no weight in the contract. When you get married with the state, God bears no weight in the contract. The state is the primary contract holder under the doctrine of parents patre. And if the husband wants to deal with the wife, they have to go through the state. If the wife wants to deal with the husband, they have to go through the state and so on. Yeah, yeah. And they tell you you have to get a divorce if you want to separate. When you get a divorce, you're still under contract with the state. So you still have to work through the state. Even if you've been divorced 30 years, you work with the state. They get involved in every aspect of your life between the two of you with the state. So I said this in one of my classes in Alabama. And it was a class of the Tenth Amendment Society. And the Tenth Amendment Society down there took this to their state legislatures. And the state of Alabama no longer issues marriage licenses. Wow. They do what I tell them to do. And what I tell them to do is to take a holy Bible, a family Bible that has the pages in it, and you record the event, the date, the time, the place, who officiated, a couple of witnesses, and you do that with your births, your marriages, your deaths in your family, and you record them in a family Bible. The state of Alabama says, take these to a probate judge and he'll record them on the land with the county recorder. And it's every bit as legal as that. But you don't have the state as a primary in your life. That's how we're supposed to get married. The Bible under public law, oops, man, 97-280, public law 97-280, the Bible is law. The Bible is the word of God. This nation was founded on God principles and the Bible is law and since 1607, we the people have been recording our marriages, our births, and our deaths in the Bible. 
and recording them on the counties of this country since 1607. It wasn't until the 1930s that we started doing this. Any religious book, you have freedom of religion. But this country was founded on Christian principles. So as far as I know, it's any Christian Bible. It's the Bible, specifically the 1611 King James Version was declared the word of, of God was by Congress made public law. Okay. It's the best I can answer that answer for you. But this is a problem. There's nothing, no line between these two except through the state. Would we be able to do that and get me at this rate and go to a probate? No. Yeah. You can do it in any state. Now, the church may not accept that. No. To get a temple recommend, they may require you have a marriage license with the state of Utah. See, what, see, see if they've been bastardized. Okay? It's not up to me. Isn't Check. that now just a money generator, though? Yeah, well, of course, but it's more than that. It's to keep your persons legal, which is the undoing of God's laws, to keep control under the doctrine of parents patre, one P, one P, two Ps, <laughs> okay? State as your parent. Once we understand these basic principles, now you can move on and you can solve things. But until you know the basics, you can't solve anything. You just go around in this big old dumb circle and get, keep getting taxed your whole life. Taxed in one way or another, whether it's a fine or go to jail, whatever. See, I started talking about indictments. If you don't pay the bill, you're brought up on charges. If you don't pay the charges, you're asked to bond. If you don't pay the bond, your body is held a surety for the bond while they steal from your trust. They take from your sus to give you trust out of your court case number, which is a CUSUP number. It's reg regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. You can look them up. Fidelity.com, if, if you know how to navigate their website, they make their website hard to navigate. An easy one is GMEI Utility. GMEI Utility, you can simply go up to the Upper right hand corner, click on the little hourglass, it brings down a little search window and it says, search for an LEI. And you type in your birth certificate number or your social security number or any of your CUSIP numbers. -E -E. LEI. And it will show you the companies that are buying and selling you. Yeah. Jody pulled it up during lunch on her, how many thousands of accounts did you have? Just under your social security? Yeah, so that's one CUSIP number of hers. And she had 100,000 plus companies buying and selling her. How much money, how much money did you have in there? Well, Will they show you how much money you have? Well, they buy them in groups, bundles. 10,000, 25,000, 100,000. Okay, let's just say they average $25,000 times 100,000. Look how many zeros that is. Okay. You're worth millions and millions and millions of dollars. They have done a very good job investing, hypothecating, buying and selling, rolling those things over. They bundle them, they roll them over, they hypothecate them. And yeah, almost 152,000 companies buying her United States Treasury bonds under her CUSIP number. And she can't even go buy a brand spanking new Lexus. See, you see what I mean? Hundreds of millions of dollars in her account. 
Oh yeah. Yeah, I've, my dad died in 1989, and I think last year, I think it was last year, I pulled his Social Security up. They're still buying and selling him. They don't care, see? They don't care. It, it lives on in perpetuity forever. Right? What difference does it make? Yeah. Right? That's why they refer to us as chattel, which is cattle. And now, now I think we've degressed to sheep. <laughs> we've become Ovid. Well, the United States Code is a wonderful thing. I keep telling the people that make the United States Code your friend because that's how we hold our public servants accountable. It's not for them to use against us, but they do use it against U.S. citizens because you're a one of them. They use it against each other. Well, if it's a United Nations country, how many people think we won World War II? No, come on, really. How many people actually think we won World War II? I guess it depends on what your definition of win is, but I'd say we did all right. Most people think we dropped a bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Japanese surrender and we won World War II. No, just Japan surrendered, okay? Out of all of our enemies and all of our allies, we were the only country that was not a United Nations country. So the only way we ended the war was September 7th, 1945, we signed the United Nations Treaty, which took effect 90 days later on December 7th, 1945, which coincidentally Pearl Harbor was December 7th, 1941. So we ended the war on, technically on the same day <coughs> that it started, but we signed the United Nations Treaty. We gave them Manhattan Island. How do we know that? Well, Rudy Giovanni, when he was uh, uh, mayor of New York City, the, the press came to him and said, can't we do something about all these guys with all these parking tickets down there on Manhattan Island? And he said, I don't have any control over Manhattan Island. I'm just the mayor of New York. Well, isn't Manhattan right smack dab in the middle of New York City? Yeah, because it's the United Nations owned it. Why did they own it? We gave it to them in the 1945 treaty, the United Nations treaty. We gave them 50 miles along the Mexican border as well. Did you know that? 50 miles wide. Those farmers down there that are right up against the border think they own their own land. They're sitting on United Nations property. What about Alaska and Hawaii that became states after December 7, 1945? If you look in our laws, it says we have 47 states and Canada in our laws. We don't have Alaska and Hawaii. They're under the United Nations. You know what else we gave them? Yeah. Part of our national parks, we gave them all of our police forces except our county sheriff's departments. Every city police force in the United States is United Nations. I built the, dish, I built the city of Bend police department building and on the blueprints there were two locker rooms. Each locker room had 115 lockers in them and a bench down the middle, and all these lockers. And both rooms were identical, except this one had a bolt door, but they were identical. Same lockers. Forgive my artwork. I'm not much of an artist. But when I built the City of Bend Police Department building, I had to build two locker rooms. And I said, how come? Well, because this one's filled, filled with the duty uniforms and this one's filled with their United Nations uniforms. So when they have to switch over. If you look at uh, State House Department Publication 6227, written in 1961, 
It's an order from the United Nations to tell the police departments to begin to find ways to confiscate our firearms. A foreign nation has to work through our State Department. So all the police get instructed from the State Department. We found this out in Houston, Texas when the floods happened a few years ago and the Houston, City of Houston Police Department had to put on blue uniforms. There's warehouses all over this country with UN yeah, vehicles. ATACs, assault vehicles in them all over this country that the chief of police has access to. So he can't touch it until the United Nations tells him he has to. What, it, what is the legal definition of the word treaty? It's a contractor agreement between two foreign nations and or entities. So if there is a treaty, they're foreign to us. It's hard to get out of constitutions and treaties. Okay. A, a executive order does not override a constitution or a treaty. We can't do the red line. <laughs> It'll override a statute, but it won't override a constitution or a treaty. Because you'd have to create a new contract or a new treaty. Or revoke it. Can we do that? I don't know. Not without an act of Congress, and he doesn't have Congress on his side. Congress controls the purse strings. I, I went to Moani and I said, hey, you know, we need some money to help fund the investigation of child and sex trafficking in the United States. And she went to President Trump. President Trump set aside $5 million to help us. <clears throat> that, that went before Congress. Congress goes, hmm, $5 million. What should we do with that? Let's create a... A child and sex trafficking task force inside the FBI and give the money to them. They don't do anything. So my job is to just really wake you up, shake you and wake you, really. And your 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 job is to. I, I don't expect you to believe one single thing I say. Go research it, find it out for yourself if you want to. Or you can just take my word for it, do what you need to do and move on and not spend 30 years of your life researching. Okay, so you can, you make that decision. <laughs> but what this takes me to is what we were talking about earlier about PTSD. Okay. Every war prior to World War II was authorized by Congress, by our government. Every war since World War II has been a United Nations authorized conflict, not a war declared by Congress. So, as a moral young man joining the Navy, the goal is to go serve your country, to protect the citizens, to protect ultimately our families back home, and to fight a righteous war. And we go to war, and we fight, and we watch our buddies die, and we get shot, and bad things happen, and we come back home. And PTSD is where our souls are in conflict with our bodies. That's all it is, because we went to war over money or oil, not a righteous war, not a war to defend our country, but a war over money or oil or some other political aspect. And our souls know that. Our souls know that even though we have the greatest of intentions and the most righteous intentions, we're out there committing murder and other sins to fight a war that's unrighteous. And so we come back with PTSD. And I call this fraud as I do most things because fraud has no statute of limitations. 
we were sold into believing that it, we were fighting for our country. And we believed that with all of our heart and all of our souls. And we were frauded. And our souls know that. Our souls are energy that holds us together. And so our souls fight our bodies. And we come back and we're having problems and some veterans beat their wives or yell at their kids. Not because they want to, not because they don't love them, but because there's something wrong with their mind. They're in torment. And they do all manner of bad things, including once every 22 hours commit suicide. And they come back and they go to psychologists and they get on drug, mind-altering drugs, thinking it's going to help them. And what they really need to do is the nice thing about fraud is at some point in time. That's the nice thing about fraud. Now let me explain that. At some point in time, fraud must be recognized. Okay? The day it's recognized is the day the wheel falls off the wagon and everything comes to a halt. And it vitiates everything that went before it. It can't start moving again until it's recognized, until it's satisfied, until it's settled. As soon as I can tell veterans this story, now, now they know why. Now they can recognize it. Now they can fall on their knees and ask for forgiveness. They can repent of sins they didn't know. And once they do, most of them are forgiven and they stop having PTSD. And I've told this story at little BFW halls and Band of Brothers lodges and things all over this country. And I've had guys come back to me a month or two months later, say, David, I was in therapy for seven years. They had me on Zoloft and all kinds of different drugs. And the 20 minute talk you gave me on this, now my marriage is better. I have a better relationship with my kids. I'm working again. I'm back on track. Thank you. And it brings me to tears every time I even talk about it. But it's until this point in time where they recognize something of what truly happened that they can finally wake up. So this goes with everything in our lives. Everything the government's doing to achieve power and wealth and authority is fraud upon we the people. You ask me, oh, are you an anarchist? No, I believe in government. I believe in limited government. Our constitution is one of the most well-written documents in history. So is the Declaration of Independence. We, the people, laid down the law in those documents, and they step outside their scope and authority, it's their fault. And it's up to us to hold them accountable, okay? The problem is we've gone 150 or so years without holding them accountable for anything. And when you don't hold somebody accountable, their rowdiness, their authority grows and grows and grows out of control. And that's what's happened. It's time to slap them back down. Right. See, the Constitution laid out 19 governmental services. We asked and set up our federal government to provide us with 19 governmental services and no more. And the and no more is a pretty big deal. 18 of them are clearly listed in the Constitution and one of them is in the preamble. So there's 19 services that we'd ask them to provide for us that we couldn't provide for ourselves. And if they would provide them, we could be going about our ways and we could be farming and logging and catching fish. 
and doing our whatever it is we do, build houses. We could do whatever it is we wanted to do. We'd have freedom. Did we ask them to provide us with 6,000 services and force us at gunpoint to pay for them? No. You ask me why I don't want to pay taxes? Because I don't want to pay for the 5,980 services I didn't ask for that they don't have a right to provide us with. So how do I hold them accountable? Part of it's by not paying taxes. I'm not gonna give them the money to do that. The problem is they're already taking it from me out of my Cessna QV trust. So unless I claim my minor estate and take half of that money back, my half, according to the public charitable trust where I'm the co-trustee and the co-beneficiary and the only signatory officer, if I don't stand up and take it back, then they're just gonna keep using it and abusing us and that I am against. See, I'm against corrupt government. I'm not against, I'm not anti-government. I'm anti-corrupt government. I wanna stop the corruption. That's why President Trump signed an executive order calling on we the people for help. He, he first set up a proclamation. You know what a proclamation is? It's a cry out. He wrote a proclamation asking we the people to volunteer to stand up. And then he wrote an executive order to support us. And he asked us for help in his proclamation of stopping corruption in the executive and the judicial branch. And a man named Chris Hallett stepped up to the plate, a very good friend of mine. And Chris said, hey, I get it. This is loss prevention for the United States of America. I've been in lo a loss prevention attorney all my life. He used to work for Napa and other big corporations as an attorney who wrote reports to show them how to save money, loss prevention. And he said, that's all President Trump's asking us for. It's loss prevention, it's an emoluments thing. That's right, Article 1, Section 6, Clause 8 of the Constitution is emoluments violations. We're paying them to do a certain job and they're operating outside their scope and authority. Therefore, it's a felony and they're creating an emolument violation that we the people can hold them accountable for. And so when we see them doing that, our job is to hold them, hold them accountable, right? So Chris set up a company called Eclaws LLC. He sent, sent his report off to the president. The president asked him to speak in front of Congress. Congress gave him permission as a LLC to act like the Bar Association. He can go into court and he can watch out for emoluments. Okay, and hold them accountable. And we all can. Chris made it so we all can. How do we do that? Just work under President Trump's executive order. We can volunteer to do anything we want. See, I, we, I got a nip, nickname, my little group of the Pentagon Pedophile Task Force. People call the Pentagon, they go, hey, you got a, a pedophile task force? And the Pentagon says, what the fuck? You know, you know, I didn't name it that. We just worked under executive order doing what the president tells us to do. We gather the evidence and we turn it in to the Department of Defense and they take it and run with it. Our job is just to gather and turn it in under executive order, so we do. And then we got this stupid name and then the pedophiles started hunting us and putting prices on our head and. You know, and they still do, so what? Anyway, at some point in time, this is where the wheel falls off the wagon is fraud. Fraud can be challenged at any time. There's no statute of limitations. Jurisdiction can be challenged at any time. There's no statute of limitations. This is a key. Two things that can be challenged at any time. You can be 20 years into a life sentence 
challenge jurisdiction due to the fact of fraud and walk out of prison. There's a lot of that. No fraud. There is. Everything's fraud. There was no full and honest disclosure of the birth certificate, for one. Did you know a vessel had been created in your name? When you got a letter in the mail and it was addressed to your all caps names, you just think somebody made a spelling error? You see what I mean? No, they're sending a letter to your vessel. They're calling the vessel. They're summoning the vessel. Are you saying that on your birth certificate it's all caps? Yeah. What if it wasn't? What if it wasn't? So it wouldn't be valid? It's always all caps on the birth certificate. On the, on the certificate of live birth, it's not always, okay. okay? They steal your soul, they take your soul prints at birth. They send you out to sea, presumed dead and lost at sea until you return and claim your minor estate. Legal definition of the word minor, somebody under the age of 18 or somebody of any age who hasn't claimed their minor estate. We're all minors in this room. Over and over again, the Bible teaches you to take dominion of the jurisdictions, land, the air, and the water. When you take dominion, then you're above anyone trying to control you. You're su juris. You're of your own rights. Your rights are unalienable. Therefore, no one can control you. See? That's why I can walk into any courtroom let them know my status, appear by special divine appearance, show them I've taken dominion over my jurisdictions, and there's nothing for them to adjudicate. It's that simple. As long as I don't murder somebody. Okay. So, these are the issues. Well, 5, 5G was designed installed originally to cause a great deal of harm and then it was recognized and President Trump came out with Kofifi. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. When he tweeted out the word Kofifi, everybody, yeah, everybody thought he misspelled the word coffee. <clears throat> What's that? Yes, it's a break it down. It's a periodic table table of the elements. Yeah, Fe is iron, so Fe Fe is two two molecules of iron. On anyway, so he had Motorola and Rayathon and a few other of our best companies build a box. It's about 18 inches by 22 inches. And if you pull the circuit boards out of them, they actually say COVID-19 on the back of the circuit boards. <clears throat> it's the Kofifi box. It's, they have been going around installing them as fast as they could on all the 5G towers, uh, trying to get them all installed before they were turned on. They didn't get them all installed. They had to make millions of these things. And what this box does is if you've got a 5G tower, Lots of little things on it. 5G are supposed to be the narrower one. Yeah, they put, a, they, they put the box on. That creates a magnetic field that surrounds the tower. It turns the 60 hertz to uh, 432. Oops. Anyway, to 432. What is 432? That's right. Because we're it created evil to righteousness. Here, here, here's another thing that people don't realize. Humans vibrate at one of three frequencies. Celestial, telestial, and terrestrial. Three frequencies. Let's tell you something. You ever watch the show The Jetson? You know about the white hats? Go to Jetson White on YouTube. This is a military intelligence channel on YouTube. 
look up a video called The Last Trump Technology. It starts with Corinthians 1, 25. That's a fun verse to read. Anyway, kind of fun to look at. You'll learn things about the Schumann residence and uh, <clears throat> there's an island off the southeast coast of Africa that our US Navy has been guarding for a very long time. And uh, what, what's taking place under that island? Uh, in Antarctica, there's a pyramid. Yeah. You ever seen the pyramid? Yeah. I got pictures of it on my phone. Um, but there's some things under that pyramid. Th thanks to the Japanese, they discovered part of it for us. Uh, they, they decided that they want, they like the best of everything. The Jap Japanese want the best of everything. And uh, so they decided they wanted the best bottled water. So where would they go get that? Down at the bottom of glaciers that haven't seen uh, air in 70,000 years in Antarctica. So they'd go over there and they'd drill down with a 12 inch drill bit and go all the way down to the bottom of these glaciers and they'd pump steam down there and melt the lake and then they'd pump it out into these big ships and then they'd ship them to Japan and then they'd bottle them, bottle the water and they'd sell it for big bucks, like $100 a bottle. So anyway, they're drilling down with this 12 inch drill bit and they hit what they thought was bedrock at the bottom of this glacier and when they pulled the drill up, they looked in the bottom of the drill bit, it had a piece of machined titanium with a high nickel content. Wow. And it, they had drilled through a spaceship, 70,000 years old. And our US Navy found out about it, because we find out about everything. <laughs> and we went down there and opened the hole up, and went down and got a whole lot of technology out of a 70,000 year old spaceship. You know, I know we're getting off the subject here a little bit, but there are all kinds of technologies that could s save us from many, many different things. And <laughs> it makes me mad that our Food and Drug Administration and other agencies of government step on those things like you would not believe. We've had cures for cancer for years. We've had all kinds of technologies. Scalar technology, it's huge. Got a doctor in Montana that can use scalar technology and if he knows the exact GPS coordinates of a guy that's sick in Africa, he can cure him from Montana using scalar. Scalar technology be, could, can be used for good or evil. It can bring down an airplane. It can freeze and or microwave, depending on if you're positive or negative it, depending on the size of the unit that you use. It could freeze an army in its tracks, turn them to ice, or it could melt them in its tracks, or it could be used to cure malaria. Scalar technology could be used for anything. And we've had it for a long time, since the late 60s. Russia had it first. It was a wonderful technology. And they knew it could be used for good, and they knew it could be used for evil. I've got the CIA report on it right here. It's a wonderful thing. I'm concerned about my grandkids going to school and um, the mass, and if they don't comply. I'd be concerned too. Yeah. I'd be suing your damn governor right now. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I know. How do we go about doing that? If oh, there's already a lot of people doing it. And How do we get involved? In but everybody needs to get involved. That, that document ought to have 25,000 signatures or 250,000 signatures. Okay, the lawsuit document is suing Herbert. Anyway, they're following a foreign agency, okay? 
the minute they do that, they shouldn't be get pay, being getting paid by us. Remove them from office. An emolument violation. It's a constitutional violation. I don't think they put that in their lawsuit. You were going to ask? I'm going to ask. I'm not, I'm not an English guy. Like Me either. I ought to ask him how to spell emolument. E M O L U M E N T. Am I right? Yeah. All that means is this. We, the people, lay down our laws, okay? This country was founded on the Law of Nations by Battelle, a book written long before there was a government on this shore. The Law of Nations by Battelle. By what? By Battelle. He's the author. The Law of Nations. We, the people, lay down the law. When our public servants step outside of the scope and authority of the law in which we lay down, they are committing an emolument violation. In other words, they're getting paid for their position of power and using it in a method that we didn't authorize. Okay? That's what that means. Oh my God. We asked, them to, we asked them to provide us with 19 governmental services. They provide us with like 6,000. On and on and on and on and on. Okay. We had a contract. A, a constitution is a contract between we the people of the states forming a U.S. government to provide us with 19 essential governmental services that we agreed to pay for. That's all it is. Anyway, United States Code, we need to make it our friend because that's how we can hold them accountable. I can't say that often enough. If you don't know it, you can't hold them accountable. The number one things that Title 18 of the U.S. Code is felonies that they commit on a regular, consistent basis. So Title 18, USC, Sections 241 and 242, we need to know. Every one of us needs to know those two, if nothing else. Okay? With those two, we can get them off of our back. All right? 241 is a conspiracy to deprive us of our rights. And 242 is a deprivation of rights. So if one officer deprives us of our rights, it falls under 242. And if two or more, It's a conspiracy to deprive us of our rights. Anything that's a conspiracy falls under RICO. Which is what Trump's trying to go after them all for. Huh? Trump's trying to go after a lot of them for all that right now. RICO Act. If you look at our, our uh, sealed indictments, which a lot of them have already been unsealed, the number one charges are sedition, and treason. Sedition and treason. Rico? Racketeering? When you're in a position like he is, as governor, how many signatures on a ballot does it take to change anything? More than that. See, he's counting on you not being able to get that many people together that's going to do it. He can get up there and lie his ass off, say anything he wants. And, they do. and if you can't get enough people together to fight me, oh well, you acquiesce. 
See? Government operates on the unrebuttal of presumption. They presume, they assume, you don't rebut. Kind of like you're right now. You go out on your daily lives, you watch your soap operas and you play your pickleball and, you know, <laughs> you don't do anything and they do whatever they want. That's how they take power. That's also a parasite. <laughs> you know I was talking about you. Huh? All right. So, it doesn't matter what you're doing, but we should be able to live our lives, ride our bikes, pip, play pickleball, go fishing. We should be able to do those things and not have to spend every waking moment learning how to combat what they're doing to us. During this period of the Great Awakening and even before, I've been doing this about 35 years, more than some of you have been alive, okay? And... During that time, I have seen many, many groups stand up to fight. And then those groups tend to go away over time because of infighting amongst themselves. They know that. They know you're going to destroy yourself. That's why I tell people I love everybody that stands up. I don't care how you fight. I don't care what group you're in. I don't care if you're right or wrong as long as you're standing. Because as long as you're making an effort to do so, the people I don't like are the ones that don't make any effort, okay? Not everybody's gonna be right. No one's right 100% of the time or our name would be Jesus Christ, okay? We're just not. I hope to be right as much as I can. But I'm not always right, I try. I try very hard, try harder than most, but I'm not, okay? But as long as we're standing and making an effort, they're not going to get away with as much stuff. They're like that bully little kid on the block that's, whose parents never discipline them. And they just steal your lunch money, and then pretty soon they're stealing your lunch box, and then pretty soon they're stealing your car. And that's what they do. They just do it a little at a time. And they gain more and more and more power. And for the last 150 years, we the people have not been good at standing up. We just haven't. The groups have been too little and too small. Now we have thousands of groups out there. We got the Jural Assemblies, we got Patriot Groups, we got Three Percenters, we got hundreds of groups just standing up. I refuse to be a part of any group simply because I know that they self-destruct. They usually get someone in who's a dictator type and it's my way or the highway and the other people are going, well, that ain't right. We're talking about our freedom here. We have freedom of expression. We should all learn. We should all learn from each other and gather information and put it to work. And I'm saying as an individual, as long as we take dominion over all three jurisdictions, most of the groups are jumping out of the water and onto the land with both feet, and they say, this is where we want to be. And then the water comes behind them and drowns their butts. See? Because they didn't take dominion over it. They didn't jump into the jurisdiction of the air either. And that's the highest form of law. Why are they only going to the land when the highest form of law is the air? You're better off putting everything in a trust, and jumping right in the, into a trust and holding the fiduciary responsibility. You got more clout, but they don't do that either. In fact, some of those groups don't even believe in trusts. In fact, I was told by one of their leaders that that was trusts were developed by the Catholic Church. And I go, you got to be kidding me. What's Genesis? Was that developed by the Catholic Church? That was long before the Catholic Church. All through the Bible is trust. Trusts are the highest form of law. Even judges know that. They know a fiduciary is the highest clout. Right? Huh? That's right. 
So why aren't they jumping into that jurisdiction? Right? All they're thinking about is property, equity, their rights. That's all they're thinking about. You can't have your rights until you take dominion over all three. This is what I'm trying to get through their heads. Once we do, there's nothing to adjudicate. We've already settled the matter. Everything is a settled matter. The trick is to be at peace. See, I want to be at peace as long as I can until I'm backed into a corner. And then by God, I'll fight. But until then, I'm at peace. And they're at war. They're, they're bringing the summonses and the warrants, right? They're declaring war. Look at the Lieber Code. We've been under the Lieber Code since 1861. March 23rd, I think. They're inland pirates. They're after your vessel, your ship. That's why the U.S. Navy raised the high water mark in Colorado. They put it up on the top of the mountain. What does that Bra mean? In brass and stone, there's a high water mark. So everything's, so everything's underwater. It's inland piracy. You know what the highway robbers are doing with the blue lights on top of their cars? <laughs> They're highway robbers. <laughs> highway pirates. Yeah, it's inland piracy. Okay. It's a, all a matter of unlawful conversion. It's, they unlawfully convert our soul, our name, the things that are most precious to us. They convert them into something else that they can control. And we just sit back and go, oh, well, shoot, I got a letter in the mail today. I guess I better answer it. Oh, it says I got to show up in court on... May the 3rd and 8.25 in the morning. Guess I better go. And you show up under general appearance to your all caps vessel name. You don't know the difference. You know, they used to call it a straw man. I hate that term. I hate that term too. Because it's not. It's a vessel. It's a separate entity. And I hold the office of person as a signatory officer for the vessel. So I sign the bills of lading. I pay the bills of the ship. I take inventory of the cargo. That's my job as a person, as a signatory officer. But until I become the captain and take ownership of the ship and pilot that sucker, I'm just a person. I'm just a signatory. You gotta take ownership of your vessel, okay? Now, once you've taken ownership, now you're the co-trustee, co-beneficiary. Until then, you have no access to it. You don't even know how to use it to pay off your car or your house. You know that one you don't own that the state does? How come you don't own your home? because of clerical errors. This is a wonderful friend of mine in Indiana. This is the tax bill he got on his home in the mail. I said, make me a bunch of copies of your tax bill. It was a one page bill. He made me a bunch of copies. I start off and I go, huh, top left hand corner, very first thing is an error. It says a parcel number. That's an error. So I circle the error and I bring in a little line down and it says land patent number 6743 and 6747. County, correct the error. Right? Go to the next page. The next little box says property type, real estate. Come on, real estate. Think about what that word is, what its legal definition is. No, it should say private property. Please correct the error. So I go to the next little box. And it says name, deeded owner name, name error. It's under Dyson, comma, Doug. 
I said, Doug, what's your name? He says, it's Douglas Allen Dyson. So I say, name error, Douglas Allen Dyson. Please correct the errors. Said Dyson Doug. Well, just said deeded owner's name. De deeded owners. A warranty deed is an abstract of title. <clears throat> and then it, go to the next box. It says property address. 3630 East State Road, 14 Columbia City, Indiana, 46725. Now, by writing it that way, they put it in the District of Columbia, a federal district. They took it off the map of Indiana and they put it on a federal district map overlay. Okay? A clear so sheet of paper really laid over the map that they could make all a bunch of errors on. So I said, wait a minute. His address is incorrect. It is in care of 3630 East State Road 14, Columbia City, Indiana, spelled out, not I-N, near, in brackets, 46725, non-domestic without the United States. Please correct the error. Which now put it at that location. Now, it says legal description. The United States Code says all property shall be held in meets and bounds. Should have a meets and bounds legal description. What is that? Well, from this marker, it's so many feet to this property corner, and then it's so many feet to this corner, and so many feet to that corner, and so many feet to that corner, and so many feet back here. And then this is the property. It's in meets and bounds. They have it as lot 76 of Stable Acre subdivision. See, they just made a clerical error. They took the meets and bounds off. They named it whatever the SMU they wanted to name it. You know what SMU is, right? The shit made up, <laughs> okay? And they made it whatever they wanted to make it, and they took off the lawful meets and bounds. So I said, error, see attached, lawful meets and bounds, land patent number 6743 and 6747, a part and parcel thereof. Please correct the errors. So then I went to the next error, and that's where all their money is. You owe this much in penalty and fees, and this much in delinquent tax, and this much in other assessments, see table four, and this much in property tax, and on and on and on. And I circled and I said, error, land patent of private property is tax exempt. Please correct the error. Land patent of private property is tax exempt? Of course it is. Oh, at the bottom of each of these, it says Exhibit A, Exhibit B, Exhibit C, Exhibit C, EFG. So then it says check here for a change of address. So I put error, boxes, Chicago Styles Manual, anything in a box is not part of the contract. And I circled all the boxes on the page. And I said, please correct those errors. Okay. Then we post his property with the land patent numbers. We put up a sign that says no trespassing, $250,000 fine without appointment, and not open to any federal agents. No jurisdiction. And we post the property. Then we record it for 90 days. Then we go record it with the county recorder's office. And then guys like Ken Cromer can move back in their house after they've been out of it for 10 months. And it's been sold to somebody else. Guess who bought Ken's house? His bishop. Now his bishop has to sue the, the, the court to get his money back. Because he can't sue Ken and get the house. Okay? The sheriff sold it to the sheriff's sale on behalf of the Internal Revenue Service. And I'm sure the money was sent to them. So we filled out some documents for the Internal Revenue Service that 
Show me where there was a verified audit. Show me where there was proper due process of law. Oh, wait, they just shut up and write you a little letter back and said, uh, oh, well, we don't have any proof of that. You, you don't owe us anything. <laughs> See? So when you go down that road, are you, are you fighting with the, are you fighting with them pretty often? You know? We don't fight with them at all. We're at peace. We just, our job is one of two things. We only have two jobs in life. One is to correct the errors our public servants make and then to educate them so they don't do it again. They're all compartmentalized legal idiots and we have to understand that so that we're not beating them up because otherwise we'd be wanting to kick their ass, right? Oh, it's a full-time job. <laughs> it's a full-time job. Well, for a while, for 150 years, you've been laxed, and so is your parents and grandparents. Right. So now we got to make up for that. We got a lot of errors to correct out there. Every property gets one of these in the mail, yeah. and there, are, everything on here was an error. Yeah. By the time you go through this, everything's circled. Yeah. So well, that's why I said they make an administrative error by a compartmentalized legal idiot. And we don't correct, so therefore we acquiesce. Most people would just write them a check for $1,307.73 and $1,254 and $2,562. And say we paid our property taxes because his, his property is literally three lots right next to each other. Records, your, your cartographer, uh, your records, go back in your deeds. In order to get your original land patent, you have to do a title search. And there may have been 20 owners. But somebody, clear back here, here. Somebody, John Doe, got the original land patent from the United States government. And then he granted it to his heirs through a grant deed. See, it can't be sold. It can only be granted. It could be granted for consideration, but it can't be sold. So he grant deed to his heirs. Right? And maybe that's Bob Doe. <laughs> and then he grants it to his somebody grant deed and then they sell it and it's a warranty deed at this point in time right here is where the county stole the property on behalf of the state and that may have been six owners ago and the land patent was probably a 640 acre piece of property and you own this little lot right here. So this is land patent number 2170 or something. And you only own this, but that's an underlying land patent. So this is why we say a part and parcel thereof. So you get the meets and bounds description of that as a part and parcel of land patent number 2170. And there's your property. Sure, before he even had this issue. Uh, but see, fraud, at some point in time, it must be recognized. So he didn't know this stuff. He didn't know there was an underlying land patent. He couldn't be kicked out or anything like that. And the sheriff came, kicked him out. He's out living on, with somebody else for 10 months. And then some ugly guy named David came along and said, hey, why don't we just put your property back into this original land patent and accept the last grant deed. We have to accept that grant deed and then record it and then publish it and then tell the court where to go and how to get there. <laughs> okay? and move back in because otherwise they'll get you on abandonment laws. So we moved back in and I had to fly back to Oregon. So 
Shauna Cox and Ryan Bundy came up and stayed with Ken the first three nights. They were out barbecuing on the backyard and the police showed up. Bad move on their part. Because he, Ken says, well, why don't you guys just call the county recorder's office and see whose name's on the deed? <laughs> and they did. And so they left. Okay. So does he get a tax bill every year? If he gets one this next year, okay. he's going to do that. Because they're going to keep trying. They don't give up for a while. Once you beat them three or four times, it's not worth their time and effort. They'll just whew, cost us more than that $1,000 to fight you. Yeah. We're going to quit. You have to do a title trace back to the original land patent, all the way back. You get the land patent, and I would get at least four certified copies of the underlying land patent from the Bureau of Land Management's office. The Bureau of Land Management took over the U.S. Land Office. They, they hold all the patents. You have to do a patent trace and then do what? Well, you got to do a chain of title trace so that you could find the last grant deed because it might have been sold 40 times, right? So you got a warranty deed, a warranty deed, a warranty deed, a warranty deed, and then maybe a grant deed back here. You got to find that last grant deed and you got to trace it back to find the land patent. Then you can go to the cartographer's office and also maybe find the land patent. And you might have to go to the BLM office, find it. But when you do your research and you find the land patent, then you do a part and parcel thereof according to the meets and bounds description. And you accept the last grant deed. And then you post your property for so many days. And then you record it. And there you go. We own it. They manage it. Can you put a patent on BLM land? As no. No. If there was an underlying land patent, that means it was once homesteaded. Then you can file on that homestead. Well, I know people that have done it both ways. <laughs> she asked if you have to buy it then or if you can just move on and claim it. And I know people that have done it both ways. But you gotta fight for what's yours. You gotta educate your public servants if they come after you. And it's usually not that hard. Condos you can't, it has to be a primer. It's supposed to be a primary residence, however, If you don't have long-term renters, all you gotta do is camp there for 10 days. See the trick, the trick on foreclosure, foreclosure is to get you by abandonment laws. Sheriff comes, puts all your stuff on the curb and kicks you out of the house, locks the door, and then you leave. And you don't come back, claim your property. I know a guy that came back Moved back into his house, day after. About 30 days later, the sheriff comes back. What are you doing here? I'm gonna throw you in jail. Threw him in jail for one night. Guy gets out of jail, he goes back home, moves in. He's there for about another 30 days. Sheriff says, I'm gonna throw you in jail for a week. Throws him in jail for a week. Sheriff can't hold him much longer than that. It depends on your state laws. How long in Utah is a contempt charge? 30 days. 30 days in Utah. So they can hold you 29 days and then they have to give you a hearing. Okay? But then what happens? Move back in. How many times can they hold you for contempt? Three times. You can spend 90 days eating with a, three hots and a cot. Three contempt charges. Just keep moving back in, and pretty soon they can't kick you out of your house anymore. People don't know that. I got a good friend in Australia who beats the Australian courts all the time. And he says this. Never give them your last name. 
They say your name? No? No, Your Honor, my name is this. They never, he says, never give them your last name because it puts you in a military jurisdiction. Okay? And, and they typically do it under all caps first. Like that. And then David Lester. Okay? So a military ID is also a CUSIP number, by the way. You were bonded again and you were insured again. In fact, since they have a good bet that you might get killed in the military, they insure you for more. Yeah. Oh yeah, just recently went from five million to 10 million on your life. See, if you were born after 1975, you were bonded for a million and insured for two. between 1933 and just a few years ago during the Obama administration, when you joined the military, you were bonded for two million and insured for five, and they raised it to 10. So who collects on that insurance if you die? Goes into your SESTA QV trust, and then any money earned on that for in perpetuity it also pays back the loans, guarantees the loans of the IMF, the initial that was bought and invested in. Think of it as FDIC insurance. At the birth, that's what it is, essentially. So, <laughs> this is kind of funny. If the IMF is the lender, the IMF lends the million dollars to the public charitable trust. They just put it out there in the public, right? Then they insure, they bond you for a million and they insure you for two. That's a guarantee that they get paid back in case you die of, uh, what is it called when little babies die a few days later? SIDS, in case you die of SIDS. So what, what is this? This is fiat. What is this? That's real money. So what, what if you get a paycheck stub? Who, who works for a living? Gets a paycheck stub. <coughs> Not many hands around here. Nobody works for a living? Okay, you get a paycheck stub. You take your paycheck into your bank. Right on the back of your check, there's a line. It says to endorse here, right? If you s sign your signatory, and you write USC 12, section 411, then in their computer, they have to convert it to real money. So they change the dollar sign. You're cheating me. No. When you open a bank account, when you sign your signature card, if you write USC 412411 on your, on your signature card, everything that goes into your bank and out of your bank is real money and it discharges your debt. Yeah, see, the United States Code is our friend, and you don't know it. Well, that's why it has to be on your signature card when you open your account. You're, gonna, you're telling them to deal in real money. Instead of computer. See, this is legal tender. Gosh, I can't even write here. Legal tender. Tender. It tenders it to a later date never discharges the debt. Real money discharges. Debt. All they're doing is hitting a different dollar key on their computer. They have to keep track of both. Title 12, Section 411. 
You have to do it through your signature card at your bank when you open your account. All money shall be converted to real money. Can you it's just a computer thing. So, so I should do that with my personal account? Yeah. Can I go back with my personal account? Then you had to educate your public servants. They're compartmentalized legal idiots, see? You gotta learn it, and then you gotta educate them and control them. It's up to you to hold them accountable. Any public servant must be taxed, pay income tax. Private individuals do not owe a tax on their wages, their sweat of their brow. Okay. W-4. You don't fill out a W-4 when you go to HR. Okay, the first thing you do is you fill out a Form 56, which notifies the IRS of what your status is. A Form 56 tells them who you are. Then, at your employer, you fill out a W-8-B-E-N as a tax exempt foreign estate and or trust. Now they can't withhold any taxes from you. Now you can't do that because you work for the federal government. Neither can you. You need to change your status first anyway. Status is everything in the law. Status, standing, then jurisdiction. So you change your status, then you take dominion over your jurisdictions, and then you have standing. You don't have standing until you take dominion. That's why they say all are equal in the law, rich or poor, black or white. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. You all have the same standing. You're all just as dead as the dead deer on the side of the road. You all are equal to that deer. You can't stand up and walk away, you're all dead. That's what being a citizen, a person, a resident is. You have to change your status and claim your minor estate. Your children are part of your minor estate until they reach age, and then they have to do it for themselves or just maintain that they are still. See, they self-determine it. The problem, the difference between them and you is you've gone about your whole life marking boxes saying you're a U.S. citizen, filling out W-4s and, and, and paying your taxes with 1040s and doing all these things, claiming to be a U.S. citizen. Now you've got to correct the errors you've been making. They haven't made those errors yet if they're still young, okay? So they don't literally have to do anything except make a declaration, reclaim their title, file it with the county. Yes, I mean, status, status is always the first step. We have to correct that error that we've been making. That's what this is to help them. Well, that, that's just kind of steps to freedom. I mean, you have to kind of get that done to correct the errors you've been making your whole life. But this is the beginning of mm -hmm. changing the status. Yeah, well, yeah, the first part is changing your status. And then when we change our status, we need to write an affidavit and communicate that. Right, because in, in the United States Code, in Title VIII, Section 1101, is our definitions of status. The federal government says, here it is. Here's all the statuses that we accept. Your job, self-determination, pick one. Notify them in writing via an affidavit under the penalty of perjury of what you are. So you're telling them what you are. You're making that determination, okay? So you notify them via an affidavit. All they have to do is have it on file. They're not gonna answer your affidavit, so what do you do with it? You make it a court of record. Now here's a part I want you guys to pay close attention to. What is a court of record? Pretty soon. I'm waiting.
an Article Three or an Article Six court is automatically a court of record. They're a constitutional court of record. Six. Okay. But what I'm talking about is not a brick building somewhere. Okay. Uh, the brick building is not a court of record. None of these courts are courts of record. In fact, in one case here in Utah, we proved that uh, the first district court of Cache County, along with seven other county courts in this state, are owned by one man who lives in Ogden and his headquarters are in Ogden, Utah, not even in Cache County. And he owns them just like a McDonald's franchise. So do you think they're government? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. He's got a, he's got a Dun & Bradstreet number. You look him up on manor.com and it says private for-profit corporation. Yet everybody, everybody gets charged of any kind of crime in Cache County, goes to the first district court of Cache County. He owns the court. Does that mean he hires his own judges? Does that mean he hires his own attorneys? Does that mean he gets a cut off what you, what fines you pay? Wow. Yeah. Do we know his name? Yes, we do. Would you say it? No. So, what is a court of record? Yeah, you picked up on that, huh? Thought I said that quickly. Yes. You want to look everything up on Dun and Bradstreet and Manta.com. Get their Dun and Bradstreet numbers. I was going to talk about this tomorrow. Manta.com. Yeah. You're getting ahead of me, you guys. Okay. This was tomorrow. I was going to talk about knowing thy enemy. Okay. All right. Your documents. become a court of record when they are properly served publicly published and filed. Your documents become a court of record when they're properly served, publicly published, and filed. So what does that mean? Okay, let's just say we're changing our status. You write an affidavit, you send it to the Secretary of State of the United States, Mike Pompeo. That's who you're required to send it to by, by the United States Code. Now me, I want everybody to know about it, so I send it to Donald Trump, I send it to our Attorney General William Barr, I send it to Mike Pompeo, I send it to the Secretary of State of the state I was born, and I send it to the Secretary of State in the state I choose to inhabit. And they all get one. And every time there's a regime change, I send it again. I want them all to know why I made that decision. Okay? So I send my affidavit to Mike Pompeo. And I send it registered mail return receipt required. So I get the green card back that somebody has to sign for. And it tells a date on when they received it. I get that back one to two weeks later. Does somebody there sign for it? I always send it notice to agent is notice to principal. Notice to principal is notice to agent. Okay? So it doesn't matter who signs for it. It's just like he grabbed it himself out of the mailman's hands. He's been served. So then I do a certified proof of service. Certified proof of service attaching that green card to a document 
that I attach to my copy of the affidavit. So you do a certified proof of service page and you attach it to your affidavit one to two weeks when you get it back. What I do is I've got a specially made page and I set the green card on it and I run a little bead of super glue right along that top edge and I bind it to that document. Okay? Now, I have to wait from the date that's on here that he received it. I have to wait 21 days for his response. So on the 22nd day of his response, I do a certified judgment of unrebutted affidavit. A certified judgment of unrebutted affidavit. He didn't respond. He acquiesced. They know that. They don't care. The affidavit becomes a judgment if they don't respond. So I do a certified judgment of unrebutted affidavit. And I lay that on top of my proof of service sheet, which is on top of my document. And now I go down to the county recorder and I put it on the land and I publicly publish it. I make it available to the public. Anybody can read it. And then, if I ever need to, first I take it home and I file it. But if I ever need to, I pull it out of my home file cabinet and I file it in a court case, along with my notice of appearance, where I'm telling them what my status is. That becomes an exhibit. See? It becomes an exhibit to my notice of appearance. So I have proof of my status. Now you can also take that document and you can go get your passport. So from Utah, you either got to go to Denver, San Francisco, or Seattle to get your passport. From Oregon, I got to go to Sac uh, physically go there. San Francisco or Seattle. I take people up there all the time to get their passports. Okay, because we get it as a state national. So how do you do that? If you look on your steps page that you were handed, you download the DS-11 form on your computer so, and print it out. Then you go to Copper Moonshine Stills and you fill it out exactly the way he tells you to fill it out. He's been helping people for 20 plus years and he keeps up to date. So I trust him, so fill it out that way. Then you take that, go to Costco or wherever, get your two photos and your ID that's required, your pieces of ID, and you have it filled out so that it's filled out the way a state and national is supposed to fill it out. Take your two pictures, take your ID that's required, take your affidavit with you, go to the agent who's going to issue you your passport. And you say this, and nothing but this. Here's my application properly filled out. Here's my two photographs, and here's my picture, I, my IDs that's required. And here is my affidavit that determines my status under Title VIII, Section 1101, A21 and 23, that I am a state national, recognized by the United States of America as a, as a clean and proper status as one of we the people, please issue me a passport that reflects that status. And then you shut up. And he's gonna go get his supervisor. Okay, and the supervisor comes out. You say, well, I submitted my application properly filled out, my two photographs and my ID is required, and my affidavit of status that determines my status as a state national accepted by the United States of America, please issue me a passport that reflects that status and then you shut up. And he'll go back and he'll say, come back at 3.30 and pick it up. And you come back at 3.30 and you pick up your passport. Can I use my proper passport as my ID? 
Your popper passport? Yes, you can. Well, it's what it used to be. Every Secretary of State makes up his own policy. So for a while, the P was popper. And then a while, the P was person. And then who knows what they peed on next. It doesn't really matter. When they scan the barcode, that's what matters. The passports are going to look like any other passports. But when they scan the barcodes, if I scan it in a police, mine in a police car, it'll say, do not stop, do not detain. What I'm telling you is we've been making a lot of mistakes. We've got to correct those errors and move on. Yes, you do. If you go, the post office is just a transfer station. And it's like the old telephone game. You remember that? If I say something into a telephone to you and then you tell them and then you tell them, by the time it gets back around, it's a totally different story. Well, when you go to the post office and try and explain this, there's no way in heck they can explain it to Denver, which is where they send it. See, all they're doing is transferring it. Gosh, if you lived in Texas, you could go to either Dallas or Houston. Yeah, but from Utah, you got to go to Denver, Seattle, or San Francisco. And your, your documents become the court of record when? Always remember this. See, if you go to court and you just submit your documents into a court case, administratively, that judge can do whatever he wants with them. He can throw them out. But if they're publicly published and then submitted in a court, it's a settled matter. He, there's nothing for him to adjudicate. He can't destroy a document or under the United States Code, he's committed a felony. You want to start holding these judges accountable? Publish your documents first, then submit them in your court case. Then if he throws them out, he's in deep doo-doo. Now you counter sue. Every state statute in the United States says this. Every state statute says this. The only remedy in a state court is a tort claim. Did you hear what I just said? If you're just playing defense, you can't win a football game. You gotta go play defense and offense, and you gotta do it at the same time. So if you wanna win, you sue them. It's a tort claim. If I go out here on the street, and I come to a stop sign, and somebody runs into me, what do I do? I want you to think about this for a second. I go to the person, I gather his insurance information. What company do you have? What's your agent? What's his phone number? What's your policy number? I don't care that much about you. It's, accidents happen. But now I go file a claim with the insurance company and they pay the bill. What does government teach you to do? To go complain. Go complain. File a complaint. I think part of that's ain't. <laughs> Nobody want to hear you complain. Nobody cares if you complain. If you do complain and they decide to investigate it, who's going to investigate it? The people you're complaining about. It don't mean nothing. Never complain about anything. It's not worth your time or day. Didn't your mama teach you that? Stop complaining. Quit whining. Stop complaining. My mom used to say that all the time. Quit complaining. She was telling me complaints don't matter. She don't want to hear it. She's not going to listen. Neither are they. But the government's really quick to hand you a complaint form. Then they can round file it the minute you walk out the door and drive out of the parking lot. They don't care. You file a claim. I, David Luster Strait, claim Bob Jones trespassed against me. He committed this 
felony and this felony and this felony. They carry a penalty of $250,000 and one to 10 years in prison. Now I sign it and notarize it. And I put it into a court. Crap. Crap. That's what they're saying. This guy actually filed a claim. And then I go, oh, and here's a FOIA request. I want to know who your risk management company is. Ah. See, up in Montana, there were a couple of people in the county who were getting beat up by the county sheriff for exercising their constitutional rights. And the sheriffs were putting them in the hospital. So we went after MAKO, the Montana Association of County Insurance, whatever it is. I don't know what it is. MAKO is the insurance company. We sued the insurance company for the amount of their policy rider. We found out they were insured for $5 million. So we sued them for $4,995,995. Because they have a constitutional rider. And they had constitutional rights as your sheriff was taken away from them. And MAKO settles the claim out of court. Writes a check for $4,995,995.95. And then MAKO goes to the sheriff, says, you ever do that again, we're dropping your insurance policy, you better knock that shit off. And you know what? People are treated a whole lot better in that county now. So you don't sue Bob Smith, you sue his, put in a claim to his insurance company. Who are these guys under their oath? Who are they bonded by? What insurance company do they have? Every one of these municipalities are bonded and insured. You know, the uh, Supreme Court of the state of Arizona has a three and a half million dollar liability policy and they're behind on their payments 120 days? I know that because we sued the Supreme Court of the state of Arizona. Utah Department of Transportation has a Dun & Bradstreet number and is a private for-profit corporation. Now the departments of transportation are actually very, very powerful. Everything in this country is about transportation and shipping of goods and services. Okay? So you'll learn some very valuable lessons about the Department of Transportation. They're required to issue you a Regulation Z plate, and most of them don't even know what one is. In fact, in Oregon, on the Oregon's website, when you type in Regulation Z plate, it says you can get them here, here, and here. What is the Regulation Z plate? Hold on a minute. Get, don't get ahead of me. All right. It says you can get them here, here, and here. So I called here. Talked to a gal that had been there 35 years. She'd never heard of one, never sold one. Never, nobody had ever asked for one. So I went to the next one. And this guy was some warehouse somewhere for the Department of Transportation. He goes, oh man, I, I think we have some lying around here. I think I saw a box of them once, maybe 20, 25 years ago. <laughs> I'll see if I can find them. I said, how long would it take? He says, I don't know, give me the rest of the afternoon. I'll call you tomorrow. Called him tomorrow, ah, I couldn't find them. Couldn't find them anywhere. No, I asked everybody, nobody knows where they are. So I called the next one. They go, oh, this is the place that actually makes the plates. I think we have a machine that makes it. We might even have some of the metal that makes them. I can't find any on the shelves, but the machine's sitting in the back corner. I'll go see if we can run it. They didn't even know how to fire it up. Wow. They hadn't sold one in 35 years. Nobody in Oregon had asked for a Regulation Z plate in over 35 years. Remember when I told you at the beginning all things are banking in this country? Regulation Z under the banking laws say they must provide you with a republic form of government under Regulation Z. So to travel freely upon the roadways, they're supposed to be able to issue you a Regulation Z plate to put on your car. It never has to be renewed, and it's your right to travel. But they, these state DMVs don't even know what the hell they are. Nobody's asked them for one in 30 or 40 years. Because they're getting all the fees and all the stuff off of That's what I asked you 
when you pay cash for your truck and then you said you're going to take us to a foreign well, then I, once I've got the MSO in my hand, I don't have to do anything. They so can't tell me what to do. No, I don't. I could fly the civil flag of peace on the front of my truck. I don't need, I don't need a plate if I, as long as I own it. You only need a plate because the state owns it. The state has your MSO. You can't do it on a used car either because the state has it somewhere. Unless under the salvage maritime laws. What does MSO stand for? Manufacturer statement of origin. Go hold, go have fun. Go hold your public servants accountable. It really does get to be fun, by the way. <laughs> Once you know what I'm teaching you here, and you know how to how to solve these issues, man, they're they're just going, oh crap. Because all they are really is paper. Oh yeah, uh, Ron, uh, Ken Cromer's bishop tried to get the federal court involved. Federal court looked at the land patent and said, sorry. Not even the federal government can override a land patent. A president of the United States signed the land patent to his successors and or assigns forever. No one, no one can override that superior title. Now, they can only take it for needful things like a freeway. Anyway. But then they have to pay a fair market value for it. So, not just kick you out for foreclosure. Have you ever heard of the coffee bean case? Okay, this guy got sued. The judge ruled against him. Before the judge was ready to throw the hammer down, he says, Judge, do you care how I pay this? It was like $1,140 or something. Do you care how I pay the $1,140? Judge says, no, I don't care. So I could pay it in coffee beans? And the judge says, I don't care how you pay it. Throws the hammer down. Guy goes home, he counts out 1,141 coffee beans, puts them in a bag, circles the transcript of the court transcript where the judge says, I don't care how you pay it, you can pay it coffee beans. He goes in the court clerk and he gets a receipt paid in full. Because the 1,141 coffee beans were worth more than the paper fiat currency. It was actually a commodity. Could have been in toilet paper. Okay. <laughs> it was not so long ago, huh? And that's an actual case on the books. Okay, you can have fun with this stuff once you learn. That, that's my area of expertise. Okay. As far as debt goes, though, let me answer his question first. Try to avoid debt at all costs. That's what I'm going to tell you. Save your money, then go buy something. Do without for a little while, then go buy some. Stay out of debt all you can. Now, obviously, if you're going to buy a house, you're not going to save up two or three hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is to go buy a house. You have to go into debt to buy a house. You probably have to go into debt to buy a car. Okay. I don't recommend it. I recommend saving up a thousand dollars buying a thousand dollar car, and then keep saving money until you get what you want okay stay out of debt if you can stay out of debt that's my advice if you can't stay out of debt learn how to establish your status standing in jurisdiction and then learn how to purchase things and pay your debt off with your birth certificate trust we we, we can do that Yes, but it's kind of hit or miss right now. And that's the problem. Because like I said, you never know who's on the receiving end. What does the Bible talk about? Warning us about. Ball. What is barium? B-A. 
What is aluminum? AL, periodic table of the elements, is ball. I owned a hydroponic manufacturing company. We built all of our hydroponics out of aluminum. I had companies calling us saying, hey, can we buy all your scrap aluminum? Well, yeah, sure. Where, where do you want it shipped to? Oh, we want to ship to the airport in Portland. What are you going to be doing with it? Oh, we grind it into powder. We spray it back on you. I said, no, I'm not selling it to you. Barium and aluminum, ball. It's talked about in the Bible. DCFS. Okay, the first thing they do when they come to your house is they want to come in and see it. Well, you're just opening the door and letting them in. That is consent. They're a private for-profit corporation. You don't know your enemy. You think they're government. They might even show up with a police, a policy enforcement agent. They wrote their own policy. I was just, we're, I'm working on a case out of Florida for a church. The FDA is coming after them. Pull up an article, I found out the FDA has 1,892 policies that were created by just an employee. She can't create policy. Somebody appointed to the position by Congress or the president can create policy. An employee can't. That's 1,890 policies that this woman created over a 30 year period that they're treating as law. And she had no authority to create those policies. Every agent of our government does that. DCFS, the, what set up that agency? You have to know your enemy, know who they are. What set up that agency? Title IV, Social Security, Title IV, and ASFA. Create, they, these two things created that agency. DCFS or CPS or whatever your state wants to call it. What's ASFA? Yeah, well, let's just call it Child Protective Services. Every state calls it something different. ASFA, American Safe Families Act. These two acts of Congress created the, that agency. In both acts of Congress, it says that they cannot take a child away from a parent unless the parent gave their consent or the parent has been tried and found guilty by proper due process of law of a felony. And if they take a child from a parent, they must search for a relative to place it with first, and then if no relative steps up to the plate, they can adopt it out to a foster home. So both things that set up that agency, this is how they get paid, by the way, it's Title IV, says they can't take your child. Yet they do, based on your consent. The minute you let them in the door, the minute you sign a family plan, they do it off of accusations. It could have been a neighbor called them and said your kid was out in the sun too long. Well, here's the reason. CPS is a private for-profit agency. <laughs> Every child is worth, and this is going to kill you, Every child is worth 3.3 million. They pull 1.5 million from the father's Sesta QV Trust. They pull 1.5 million from the mother's Sesta QV Trust. 
they get $300,000 at between eight and 16,000 per month from Title IV D and E funds. If they adopt a mount, the United States government pays them a $40,000 bonus. Now, here's the part that makes me just want to grab arms and go, is that the CPS agent themselves, depending on how many ch children per month they remove, they get bonuses. They get bonuses. You can't even believe how mad that makes me. Is that why kids are moved through the child protective services system? Out of the 800,000 children trafficked a year in the United States, 86% come through those agencies. The balance are just taken off the street. Eighty-six percent. How can they just disappear? Still you want me to tell you? Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you. All right, their policies state this. First of all, they take your kid. Let's just say you had an accusation they show up with a cop, they take your kid, they have you sign a family plan. And that family plan says you'll do this and you'll do this and you'll do this. It could be drug testing, psychological evaluations, bond, uh, whatever. Okay? All these services that they will provide. Every time they get you to do a service, they get to bill Title IV for those services. They spend 18 to 24 months making you do services, telling you that if you do these services, you'll get your kid back. Bullshit. Their goal, it is not in their financial best interest to return your child to you. I'm telling you right now. You know how many parents I get phone calls from that I did, say they did everything they were told to do, that they went above and beyond, that they did 110%, and they don't know why they're not giving their kid back? And last week they terminated my parental rights. What do I do? You don't comply. That's what you do. They terminate your parental rights, and then they move that child through the guardian at litem, Usually there's one, and I hate to say this, but there's one pretty female attorney in her late 40s. I don't know why this is, but I've investigated child and sex trafficking for many years. All over this country, I can name names of pretty female attorneys in their 40s who are like the priestess who facilitates the trafficking, and they always are a guardian at litem, and they move them from one foster care to another, and pretty soon they're deleted out of their system, and they don't, never end up in the next foster care, and they're gone. My job here today is to piss you off. Really. Because if you, I don't piss people off, they won't get up off their couch and do anything about it. You have to understand the process, and then you have to go after them on attack. You have to go on the offense. As long as you're playing defense and you're jumping through their hoops, you're never going to get that kid back. When you finally say you're at your wit's end, this is why they do this. This is why they string you out so long, make you jump through these hoops. They want you to give up as soon as possible. I cannot even believe my country has stooped this low. You know what the turnover rate in Child Protective Services is for an employee? I had the head person from CPS out of Arizona call me on the phone. I said, David, you know what you're doing to us? 
I cannot hire people fast enough. We're training 16 CPS workers a day in Arizona because they're all quitting because of you. We took them from 40,000 children a year to 7,700 7, a year being trafficked in Arizona. And I just got the figures for last month. It was 577 kids went missing in the system. No, this isn't what was taken. This went missing in the system last month. I cried when I got that yesterday. But I get those reports from all the states. And that was just Arizona. Pizzagate in 2016 and all the media shut it down. And then we've got now Epstein Island. Well, I know Q is. You know what Q is? Most people don't. See, there's Qs and there's QAnons. Yep. QAnons are trying to figure out the Q codes. Yeah. They're doing a good job of being a news media. Q tells the news and they interpret it and try and get it out there. They don't always get it right, but we love them. Q is led by the President of the United States and it's all of our groups of military intelligence with the DOD. It's also another agency as well. Out of Virginia? Well, that's where all the military intelligence are, pretty much. I was told and yes, out of Virginia. I was told that Most of the QAnons don't even know who Q is. Q is a group of people. If you took a circle and you built the Great Wall of China right down through the middle of it, you could write the name of every organization on earth in that circle. You could write the military, any branch of it. You could write the DOD itself. You could write the White House, the administrative branch, the judicial branch. You could write the CIA in there. You could write the Mormon church, the Catholic church, the Protestant church, the Baptist church. You could write any organization on earth in there. You could write Google and Apple and, and Verizon. No, they're, they're over here. All but... What I'm saying, yeah, there's black hats and white hats. There's good and bad. There's righteousness and evil. Okay? All right. Now, in saying that, in, in this whole child trafficking stuff, I was turning in evidence to General Valley and then Millie and others. I work with uh, Special Operations Command. I work with Coronado. Um, and turning in this evidence. And then I, wow, some stuff I'm turning in gets dealt with. And some stuff is like I throw it into a trash can or into the black hole. So we had to figure out which side of the fence they were on. Am I handing the information to the bad guys? Yeah, I was for a while. Some of it was getting handed to the bad guys. Because sometimes when you walk through the door, you don't always know who's going to come see you. Now we're more careful about that. You can't serve two masters. What is legal is not lawful. And they represent what's legal. That's unjust. It's unrighteous. It's the undoing of God's laws. How can they serve two masters? How can they undo God's laws and propose to follow God's laws. They can't do both. William Barr wants to tear up his bar card. William Barr wants to bring down the bar. He wants to get back to the rule of law. That's what he wants. Okay? He wants to be the one to bring the bar down. I hope he does it. And I hope he does it soon. Because literally, that's who we, the people, have been at war with for a long time because of Justin's story. They control everything, every corporation. They control it all. Every form you fill out. This is why I don't like government forms. I try not to fill out any government forms. Sometimes I'll take the government forms off the court's website 
and I'll make them into my own. And I'll take out all the boxes and all the lines and all, and I'll just make it into my own. And then I submit it. And guess what? They take it. Hmm. But attorneys write things to remove the liability from whoever they're writing it for and place it upon whoever's signing it. Okay? Now, that's the main reason they don't bring child protective services down. It is a huge income producer. $3.3 million per child, 800,000 children a year. That's just the ones that are trafficked. Everything evil mirrors everything that's righteousness. Yeah. So whatever they're committing, the evil, are doing, they try and mirror that back upon the innocent. Yeah. So it's not them, it's you doing it. Yeah. And then they I, know of, the right I know of two police officers right here in Utah that are sitting in jail for molesting their own children and they didn't molest their children. I guarantee they are innocent and didn't do it. But because they ran into a satanic cult and they started bringing it out and turning it in to the wrong people, they got charged. And they're in jail right now. And they were just young cops who didn't know any better. All they did when the time they were little was wanted to grow up and serve and protect the people. And then they got into it and found out how evil it truly was. And then they started speaking out about it. And then they were persecuted. They persecute the righteous. Let's look at some current events. Look at uh, uh, Beirut, Lebanon. Right. Okay. What happened there? Does anybody know exactly what happened there? In Lebanon. In Beirut. A bomb. Yeah. It was a targeted attack with advanced technology that we are not supposed to have yet. No, no, it wasn't. But you're close. I knew something. Okay, people think, what did they report? What did the news report? Fireworks. Yeah. Fireworks plant caught on fire too close to a fertilizer storage plant. Yeah. Well, no, they had 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate. Uh, okay, all right. That's what, that's what they claim. Yeah. Okay, the bullshit meter's really deep on that one. Yeah. What happened is, <laughs> what happened is this. <laughs> Evergreen's a shipping company. Hillary Rodham Clinton. See, when we remove the politics, the right, the left, and we yeah. start to look at the right. evil. Yeah. George Bush was evil. Hillary Rodney Clinton was evil. Obama's evil. You start to really recognize that these are big corporations doing some very, very, very evil stuff. I'm not going to write the name down here. These are three cargo container companies that we've identified as child trafficking companies. One is owned by Hillary Rodham Clinton's foundation. One is owned by... Paul Pelosi, Nancy's husband. Okay, so we went into Pier 45 in San Francisco and we burned it to the ground. When was this? A couple months ago. Okay, in Beirut, in Hong Kong, at the uh, the fires in Brussels at the World Trade Center, several other big major fires that have happened in the last couple of weeks. We've been taken out in Evergreen all over the world. Nice. In Beirut, cargo container company, shipping containers. Okay, we've been taking Evergreen out all over the world. So in, in Beirut, since we trained Mossad, Israeli military industries, we sent them into the tunnels to rescue all the children under, under about two and a half square block area. They even had an underground hospital, underground dormitory, underground everything. Lots of children under there. 
And we sent them in and they came out and they lit the place on fire and that's why you saw smoke long before the missiles hit. It was on fire. It's pretty hard to burn down concrete and steel. <laughs> it's real hard to burn it. So anyway, they spread some stuff around in there and they lit it on fire to cause a smoke screen. Because if you remember how that sat, you had that kind of island and you had three buildings like this. And then you had a big glass building like this and most of the town is over here. This building was designed to stop the blast, right? What's that? No, these are bi these are concrete They're structures. Structures, okay. They're filled with evergreen shipping containers, and underneath is child trafficking tunnels all over underneath. They do that. They'll lead clear into the city, mainly led into this building, so the trucks can back up over here and pick them up. Okay. So they went in there, they rescued the kids. They set the building on fire. And then, and then <clears throat> our military estimates engineering. Depending on the width of the concrete wall, how much steel reinforcement rebar they think is inside the wall, how many shipping containers around the outside of the wall, they try and estimate what size bomb to throw in there to take that out. They don't care if this building hits, they're trafficking them out of that building too. So they didn't care if that one blew up either. But this is what they were after. So they estimated what size bomb. And they happened to, in this case, use a Moab. A mother of all bombs. <laughs> Well, in between the time intelligence went in and located the kids and planned the mission, and the mission took place, some containers had been moved. A couple other things they underestimated is the construction quality of those buildings. Over in the Middle East, not always is a building built up to our standards. So it had a little less rebar, a little wider space, a little more porous concrete. And so when that bomb went in, it blew a little bit harder than they expected it to. Nevertheless, it did its job and it left a crater that opened up the tunnels. And then people could, the news media could look down in there and go, ha, ah, there's a whole bunch of tunnels. Now they crawl under the tunnels, they find the dormitories, they find the medical facilities, they find all this stuff, and they don't know exactly why. So the object of the game is this, is to not only destroy it, but it's to expose it, right? But the news isn't exposing it. Yeah. That's why President Trump fights the news all the time. Is, does a, not, a, does not a single day go by that he isn't calling them fake news? I called exactly the They're never going to report the truth. Now we have OANN and we have Twitter. I like Twitter for the news. That's where I go because it comes right out of the horse's mouth. Yes. I want to know exactly what the president says, what our top generals are saying, and what William Barr is saying, and what Mike Pompeo is saying. And I want to know exactly what they're saying right out of their own mouth. So I followed them on Twitter, and guess what? I cut out the middlemen, known as CNN and others, yes. and I just cut them out of the picture by listening to the horse talk. This is the United States of America, believe it or not. No, I have no idea how to draw. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. What I'm going to tell you is this. We know where all the rat lines are and where they go. What is a rat line? It's a trafficking line. What is it, a rat? Rat. This one actually splits. A rat line Known up the East Coast and up the Hudson River. There's, a, there's actually five main trafficking lines. This one kind of got, got
goes uh, mainly actually from Louisiana, Alabama, so four is like that. Right in here, there's another one that goes up. There's five trafficking lines in the United States, rat lines. What if I was to tell you something like this? I wasn't going to do this till Sunday. But what if I was to tell you that there is an attorney who has an office in Poughkeepsie, New York, and an office in Bellevue, Washington. Same attorney. And he's partnered with an attorney out of Bellevue and an attorney out of here. And what if I told you that out of this office, he created over 100 corporations to traffic children? I'm talking about entertainment companies that take pictures, lodging companies, short and long distance trucking companies, even an airline that's stationed at Boeing Field. Offering companies, you have to have all elements of trafficking. So you have to have transportation, logistics, offerings, okay? Five by five entertainment, wild child entertainment. Corporations like that, he's set up. What if I told you he set them up under mostly aliases names, but we have the real names too. What if I told you he set them up for people who are Police officers, county commissioners, and judges. I'd believe it. Okay. I read Frank on the cover up. Now, what if I told you the same attorney in the state of New York owns 17 child protective services agencies in the state of New York? And he also owns 17 family courts. He owns the Spafford Center, which traffics children to Jerusalem and the United Kingdom. What well, if I told you I had pictures of two American boys with a Hezbollah boy over in Jerusalem carrying AK-47s and one's seven and one's 11, and I know where family they came from here in America. What if I told you in 1983 he bought a company from William Casey's law firm the DOD guy is going to start scribbling here when I mention names. I'm serious. William Casey. Who was William Casey? He was the head of the OSS before it became the CIA. He was our first CIA director, and then he ran the SEC. Securities and Exchange Yes. And helped. They're stacked deep. Helped set up our whole birth certificate fraud thing. He also started the Spafford Center under a different name back in the 30s. And he died in 1975, and in 1983, this attorney bought it from Casey's law firm. It's a corporation soul. Does anybody know what a corporation soul is? It's a corporation that started so old that it's grandfathered into under all laws. It's a powerful corporation, a corporation soul. It was owned by William Casey. I, don't, I wish he was. Anyway, and he can take children out of New York City or any other county that he has one of his 17 agencies. He can show up at your house with a cop, kick in your door, his CPS agents, take a kid, jump you through a bunch of parental hoops, terminate your parental rights through his own judges and his own guardian ad litems and his own, and he's licensed by the state to do business. He's protected under the commerce laws. He's sanctioned by the state. When you run his name of his family services companies on Google, they come up higher than the actual state of New York's family services in the search engines. So if you're going to turn somebody into CPS and you Google it, good chance you're turning it into a guy who set up hundreds of pedophile companies. Because they do protect each other. Now, what do you think about that? 
Makes you want to stop being a teacher and grab a firearm and go start killing heads, right? This is how I feel about it. Because I'm, I keep gathering the evidence, keep turning in. What if I told you I tie that man in as the head of the tree and evidence branching off him is what put Weinstein and Epstein in jail? They're just small peas in the pot. They're just billionaires. See, it's easy to take down the bottom level. There's the four types of people we have in the, this country. We have the sheep, they go about their daily lives, they don't know anything. We got the sheep dogs, that's the ones that stand and try and protect the sheep from the wolves. And we've got the wolves, and then we have the bams. Okay? These guys are Illuminati. Did I spell that even close? Uh, who cares? Who cares how I spelled it? Illuminati. They drink the blood of children. They live off adrenochrome. How many people use Google? How many people use Android? And you know you support child trafficking? No. What is Google's operating system? It's Adreno. What is their search engine? Chrome. How about Verizon? Who has Verizon? Moloch. Verizon worships the god of Moloch. I just found that out a week ago. Big corporations that we're all supporting innocently, and you're supporting child trafficking. They fund it. They create foundations to pay the wolves to traffic their children. These guys are more numerous than you think. Many, many, many of them. It's bigger than all of them. It's bigger than that. I've heard that they've got armies. Oh, yeah. Ready to Protectorates. And armies ready to what if I told you they're, most of them pose as if they're helping the children? Yes. Yep. What if I told you some of them were UNICEF? What if I told you they were a lot of ex-military groups with special arrest powers working under, say, veterans for children? So that's what I heard just recently. And they're protecting the Illuminati and the vampires. Just recently I read that uh, they've got all these ex-military... And what if I told you that they put in a price on the head of people like Tim Holmseth and me and others? Yes. Many, many, many vamps. But here's the group I want to talk about right now. These are uh, county commissioners and mayors and attorneys and judges, police officers, SWAT team leaders. They're in our communities every day. And they're running legal businesses on the side. What if I tell you I know a SWAT team leader in California who when he was in the United States Army stationed in Washington that the attorney that I was telling you about formed three corporations just for him under an alias name. Three corporations while he was in the Army. After he left the Army and he became a police officer and he graduated his way up to SWAT, and he's a SWAT team leader for two counties. He's won two awards in the state of California for the number one in surveillance in the state of California. And he's That's protected scary. by everybody. But he also protects everybody. What if I told you in the state of California in 41 counties, the sheriff is also the coroner? And what if I told you he's also in the Masonic Lodge? And sometimes the sheriff's office, the Masonic Lodge, and the coroner's office is all in the same building. Look at Placerville. Look at Auburn. 
There's two cities right there. They're in the same building. So he could shoot you, write the report, cremate your body, bury it, cover it up, and he can do it on the behalf of a judge who told him to. Wow. So I got a question. It's a perfect storm. There's nobody to answer to. But remember, you can draw any circle, build a great wall of China in it. You can write the, a name of an organization in it. Yes. I don't care if it's the Masons, the Shriners, or what it is. Okay? And half of them have no idea what's going on, and they're a good, honest, righteous people. A lot of builders are Masons. Okay? But until they reach those upper levels, it's like this. On the back of a $1 bill, you'll see this symbol. This is the Pindar. This is the Council of the Thirteen. This is the Council of Three Hundred. You can write the name of every organization on earth. And when it hits this level and it goes up into here, it's controlled. This is all controlled by the Illuminati, by the Pindar, ultimately by the Pindar. You have to understand these things, yes. how they work, so that you're not blaming every Mason. You're not blaming every one in every organization. It's like when I was turning the evidence. I was turning in and it, sometimes I'd get one person, sometimes I'd get another, and I found out one's righteous and one's evil. You find that out over time. It's been bothering me. <coughs> so, anyway, the wolves. The wolves are the ones that set up legal corporations to traffic children. And they're protected by the state. Anybody can bait a pedophile. I mean, you can get an 18-year-old girl that looks like she's 12 and set her up in a little house out in the country somewhere with great military fanfare after a pedophile shows up, come in and arrest the guy. Anybody, can, that's called baiting. You can bait them and, and they'll show up. And you can take them down and you can do it on high definition camera, good camera equipment, and you can put that on the air, and you can raise a tremendous amount of money off that video, and you can use it pretending you're doing good work for children. And he might have just been one of the ones you wanted to take out. Because this is what happens. Now you got these legal corporations, lawyers, judges, family courts, CPS, you got, you got trucking companies, airlines, Solimar Airways, based out of Boeing Field, was set up by J. Scott Greer, the attorney I was telling you about, in New York and Bellevue. A legal airline. But it flies cargo. Evergreen. A legal corporation. The state can't interfere in commerce, Title 15. It protects them just as well as it was. I was telling you how to protect yourself. Yeah. So the case you think I learned this just by... The state can't step in and do anything about it. No. No, they set up legal corporations to do this. And they do it under an alias name. So let's just say they set up a short distance trucking company and you see a bunch of these little 20 foot trucks with the roll up doors, right? For local, right? Usually they always have an anesthesiologist or a dentist or a veterinarian or somebody who can drug the kids so that it's quiet in the back of the truck. But let's say they didn't give them enough drugs and the kids are yelling and screaming. They come up to a stoplight next to a cop car and the cop car hears all the screaming kids from the back of this truck. He pulls the truck over. Well, what the attorney did is he goes in and he sets up four or five of those companies and they do something like this, JRE1, JRE2. JRE 5, JRE 7, JRE 9. And they set up all these trucking companies, but they only use one at a time. So a truck gets caught. Then it switches to the next one. The driver's the fall guy. He goes to jail. They just changed the magnetic sign on the door to JRE 2. Does the driver even know? Sometimes it? not, if they drugged them well enough. A lot of times the driver's sitting in their truck, the car is loading the back, they hit the side of the car, go ahead, take it to this location. But he becomes a passy when the cop stops him, and he goes to jail having a couple of kids in the back, and they just do it again, and do it again, and do it again. 
And then their long distance trucking company is based out of Missouri, operates on all coasts. Whole different company. They set up logistics companies and some lady sitting at a desk lining up the loads. She's just getting calls from people telling them, to, I, need a, I need a load picked up here and dropped off here. She's just organizing it all. She's a logistics company. She's, she a, compar she's, she's a compartmentalized legal idiot set up by the vampires. So does she know or not? No. Maybe not. She's just moving freight. That's all she's doing. Yeah. So there are a whole bunch of legal corporations under the wolves. protected by the United States Code. They can't interfere in commerce. They're CPS agents. So how do we shut them down? They're family courts. How do you shut them down? You have to prove all elements of child, child trafficking. This is why I love our president right here. If, if, for, if for no other reason, here's why I love him. He made child and sex trafficking an international crime so it falls under the UCMJ instead of the DOJ. Now what's the UCMJ? So now I can turn the evidence in instead of to sometimes the FBI who covers up crimes for the deep state. Mm -hmm. And I can turn it into the military and hopefully I get an honest military who's on the right side of the wall. And then we can pick them up at 2 a.m. We can put them on a C-136 or a C-5 and fly them <laughs> south. <laughs> Hope they enjoy the heat for the short period of time they're gonna be there. What if I was to tell you that one of the companies in Washington that that attorney set up is a medical coding research company? What if I told you Obamacare was set up for one reason and one reason only, and that's to traffic children? Obamacare, that's the only reason it was set up. What if I told you that they invested so much money, they built three supercomputers in the university in Austin, Texas, that a mother can go to her gynecologist, find out that she's pregnant, and the moment he puts in the code, the child traffickers are following that mother, their pregnancy, they know whether she's gonna get an abortion, whether she has a live birth, they follow the kid through the first few years of school, they know if it's got blonde hair, blue eyes, or red hair, green eyes, or whatever. And what if they got blood type, DNA, all your medical records. So Obamacare coding system removed doctor-patient confidentiality from the United States and the world. It, don't think and it just here. happened here. It happened all over the world in every United Nations country when that was passed. And all your we started it. So. It's a five-digit coding system with over 80,000 codes. We call it medical kidnapping in this country. If you, you I, I have parents that have walked into Phoenix Children's Hospital, and they can be up there with, talking to their doctor. Their doctor writes stuff down in his notes. He hands it to the medical coding expert in his office. She takes it. She puts it in the computer. CPS and the Superior Court of Arizona leases space in the basement of the hospital. A red flag pops up on the CPS agent's computer down there. She has every medical record, the home address, the parent's name, everything. She can cut, paste, put it on her documents in order to remove, walk it next door to the judge, have him sign it, get in the elevator, be upstairs within five minutes taking the child. For, on what grounds? Whatever they want to think of. Medical yeah. I, I heard they lease space in every hospital. They do. Every hospital, yeah, every hospital, the courts CPS. and CPS, and every major hospital in the United States, they lease space. But let me tell you something. I'll tell you what they've told me. They told me all the evidence that we've turned in, in the last three years, it could take the military as long as 10 years just to yeah. take care of it. There's not enough people to even take care of it. What if there were? Sweetheart, I'm going to tell you there is. And we have a lot of help right now. And we haven't had that help for that long. And I don't really want to talk too much about it, except one-on-one -on -one in private, maybe. I'll show you some things, okay? But we have a lot of help right now. I always knew there was good and evil. I always knew 
that when people rise into a position of power, a lot of times they get very corrupted and they start committing the seven deadly sins and then Satan takes over. But what I didn't know until maybe five or 10 years ago is that the whole world revolves around child and human trafficking. Our entire, think about what I told you about our birth certificates. We're being bought and sold legally to fund governments all over the world. This is why they can afford to be so bloated, to have agencies. They're only supposed to provide us with 19 essential governmental services and no more. They're providing us with 6,000 and forcing us a gunpoint to pay for it. But they're also using our trafficked selves, yeah. our trusts, to fund that. Here, here's one thing about good and evil, both. They both have to disclose ahead of time. Yeah. That's the universal nature of law. They have to disclose it. And it's been disclosed for a long time, but we just didn't, never noticed. We don't pay attention. Well, we don't we pay didn't attention. That's right. That we didn't know what no. To look for. Plus, it's like a puzzle. Okay? Yeah. They throw away the box top, yeah. <laughs> and then they put one piece here, and yeah. one piece here, and one piece. And you got to figure out, we'll gather up all the pieces, figure out what is a piece, gather up the pieces, and then you got to put it together to see the picture. All right, here's what's happening in China right now. I've been to China three times in the last five years, six years. I've traveled all over China by train, many of the major cities. They're some of the most wonderful people on the face of the planet. They love their families. They think it's a sin for their elderly to die in the hospital. Mm -hmm. They take care of their kids. They take care of their families. They use the spaces in between the freeways to grow gardens and farm pigs. They barter, they trade, they do many, many things right. And then you've got about one million people in the Chinese government who are communists and ha control a great deal of the money and all the military might. And this one million people are communists. There's about half a million Muslims. And then you've got all the rest of the people who stood up and declared the fact that they wanted to join the sovereign government of Mongolia. Oh, shit. And so the Chinese government used their, their weather manipulation weapons, and they've been raining down on China and flooding China and all their buildings. They live up here, and this is commercial. So they're flooding out all their commercial. So the people are starving. Their restaurants are flooded. Their grocery stores are flooded. They, they, all their supplies, their toilet paper is non-existent. They're flooding all the cities with rain and storms. The ones that can't flood, they create lightning. Lightning's so powerful, it splits buildings in half. That ain't natural. Whoa. They're using all kinds of weather manipulation to genocide the people of China who are trying to gain their sovereignty. Most people don't. It's easy to manipulate the weather. What if I told you off the coast of California, about 150 miles out, there's five shipping container ships. These ships are gigantic. Five of them, tied end to end. And they have great big turbo fans on them, about 15 feet and 20 feet in diameter. And they're aimed at our jet stream. And they can turn all those fans on and they can manipulate our jet stream and move it up. They can shove it up into Canada in the winter time so it brings ice cold to the Northeast and the Great Lakes. They want heat. They can shove the jet stream down so it warms up over California and Arizona, and then it moves back up naturally and cooks and causes tornadoes through Texas and Oklahoma and Tennessee, which creates hurricanes 
in the Gulf and Florida, Haiti. They can move the jet stream wherever they want. Yeah. Yeah. Why aren't we torpedoing, torpedoing those boats, sinking them? Because they're private for-profit corporations protected by the state. We can't interfere in commerce. We can only regulate it. It's going to be up to us. It's going to come down to we the people. When we learn and we decide enough is enough. The part we have to understand when we do this is like kind versus like kind. So when you as a man or a woman go and try and sue a corporation, it never works. You have to sue them as your corporation to sue them. Okay. When you go after a man, you go after him as a man. You can't go him after as your corporation. So what they try and do, these attorneys aren't stupid. They try and break your veil. Say so it's called breaking the veil, whether it's a veil of a trust, a veil, a corporate veil, or the veil of a man or a woman, the individual. They try and break your veil. So if you're not careful in your documents, if you're not careful in your words, if you're not careful in your words verbally, as well as on paper, then you combine jurisdictions in the wrong way, you lose. And you don't know why you lose. You go, oh gosh, we did everything right, and somehow they just threw it out. Well, they throw things out on a technicality. One of the main reasons they throw things out is that you don't make your documents a court of record first. You take your document, you write it, you sign it, you go get it notarized, and you go file it. You skipped a step. You didn't record it. You didn't publish it. If you don't publish it, it's not a court of record. If it's a court of record, it's a settled matter. Then they throw it out. They're committing a felony. It's destruction of property. The problem is you need that county stamp on your document when it's recorded in the court. That shows the judge that it's been publicly published. So it's important to have that county recorder stamp on the top of your document when you place it in the court. Yeah, but you have to do a certified proof of service sheet. And I can, I can give that to you. Yeah. We will. We'll bring this up tomorrow. Okay. There's a reason this is a three-day class. Today is wake you and shake you and hope you give you so much information you want to come back tomorrow. And we'll just keep learning. You guys keep asking questions, bring in things you need to work on. We'll keep learning. That's what it's all about. You learn as much as you can from me. You can use any county in the nation you want to. Some counties and some states charge hundreds of dollars to record documents. You can use Lamar County, Georgia for 10 bucks a document or Pima County, Arizona for 30 bucks a document. I just FedEx it down there, give them the money in the money order, talk to the gals down there. So you always make four or five originals of your documents, always. When you study the law, you're going to find out that your documents become a court of record when they're properly served, publicly published, and filed. That's the three requirements. And then they're a court of record. What does that mean? What does a court of record mean? It means they're on the record, that they're adjudicated. They're there. It's the truth. It's filed. So they can't just pull them out and remove them. Now they're permanent. That's a felony. They, the only time they can do that is if they completely close the case and wipe it off the face of the earth. And sometimes you can force them to do that. In Gina Nilsson's case here in Utah, we filed over 700 pages of documents. She had already been tried, found guilty by a jury before I met her. After I met her, we filed 700 pages of documents. She got held in contempt three times for 29 days each, went back to a hearing. The first time was to force her to try and have an attorney and she said, no, 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 he's fired for a cause of fraud and swindle and ineffective assistance counsel, retroactive back to the very first second. That's how you fire an attorney, by the way, okay? 
the United States Code mentions the cause of fraud and swindle right in it. Okay. So they tried to, they spent 30 days trying to force her to have an attorney. She said, no, 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 I'm so jurist, I'm so jurist. She kept standing upon her rights. Then she mouthed off again, they threw her in contempt of court. And they spent, they spent 29 days showing up at the jail trying to get her to sign a plea deal. And she said, no, 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 I'm not signing anything. I'm not signing anything. I'm not signing anything. I don't have an attorney. I'm not signing anything. They called her back in for a hearing. They threw her in jail for contempt of court, trying to force her to have a psychological evaluation. She said to the psychologist when he came to the jail exactly what I told her to sign. Say, get tired. Exactly what I told her to say. And that is this. I had 13 years of government-controlled curriculum, government-paid-for school system, and I got a certificate of competency called a diploma. Now, Gina also had a degree in psychology from the University of Utah, so she told them that. I had four years to get a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Utah. And they gave me a certificate of competency called a degree. And then she said, and other than that, I don't answer questions. And so she was deemed competent. And if you're competent, and you don't have an attorney to sign on your behalf, and you don't sign on your behalf by taking a plea deal, guess what? They don't have enough signatures to put you in jail. So she walked out of the courtroom and went home. So that's why all those guys are now here. 15, 15 years of her life saved after she had been tried and found guilty by a jury. Well, how about I see you tomorrow? Call the day. You. You're welcome.